Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited that you could join us today for our next Facebook how to series on extensionhorses.org. My name is Krishna Martinson, and I'm the equine extension specialist here at the University of Minnesota. And today we have uh, Susie White, who has so wonderfully agreed to join us and look at her background. Is it not the perfect background to talk about how to care for horses during cold weather? And Susie, you tell me that in Michigan, it is like a little mini blizzard happening. It is, yes. It is snowing hard right outside my window right now. <laughs> so you, you didn't even have to like, this was a, a legitimate picture that reflects the current happenings in Michigan. Yes. And really, who better to talk about cold weather care than somebody from Michigan and Minnesota? We have to have a little bit of cred just because of where we live. Absolutely. All right. So the first thing is people are jumping on. It's always fun to just learn about you and your career path because we have a lot of individuals, a lot of youth that follow our page. And I think they're always interested in you know, you and how you got to be where you are today. So I'm, I have all the questions on my phone because I have Facebook here and I have our Zoom meeting here. So if any of you have questions, please ask them on the Facebook Live and I will make sure to ask Susie those questions. So the first question is, just tell me about yourself, your career path and your education and how you got to be in your current position and maybe just a few of the responsibilities of your current position. Sure, great. Well, thank you again for having me today. I am Susie White, and I currently work for Michigan State University Extension as a 4-H program coordinator in Northern Michigan. I actually grew up in Northern Michigan, but I could not wait to get away from the long, hard winters. I attended Michigan State University, where I received my bachelor and master's degrees in animal science while competing and then coaching the equestrian teams, as well as continuing to stay active in the horse community. After graduation, I moved east and I taught for 10 years at Delaware Valley University, which is located in Eastern Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. I taught a variety of classes in the equine science department. My favorite classes to teach were equine nutrition and Introduction to Equine Science. My family and I moved back to Northern Michigan seven years ago, and we live on a small farm in Traverse City with our three children, dogs, cats, chickens, various 4-H project animals, and of course, horses. Uh, we own horses, and we also do some short and long-term boarding. In addition to the farm and working for Michigan State University Extension, I also teach and train dressage and jumping disciplines. I host some local horse shows and even compete myself from time to time. Currently at my personal farm, which a small snapshot of it is in my background, I have an older quarter horse gelding and his miniature horse companion, which are being short-term boarded while their family is on vacation. I have an older quarter horse mare that I board for a neighbor, a Welsh thoroughbred cross pony that I board for my daughter's friend, a young Arabian gelding, a Morgan gelding, and an oversized miniature horse that we keep as a companion. Well, your place sounds fun and it looks beautiful. I would love to visit, but when it's warmer. <laughs> wow, so that is really interesting that you know, I think a lot of people are in your position. You were in Michigan, you started in Michigan, you went away and that was Delaware Valley? Yes. And that, so I'm making an assumption here, is that in Delaware? Nope, it's in Pennsylvania, just See? north of Philadelphia. Yeah, so okay, so then you went to Pennsylvania and now you're back in Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, so I always tell students, sometimes you have to leave home in order to come back home. Definitely, yeah. All right, so let's get into the topic of today's how-to uh, session. And that's really how to care for horses during the winter months. And obviously you are having a current event in Michigan that is really makes this very, very timely. So the first question is, 
Can you explain the horse's response to temperature? And at what temperatures are horses most comfortable? And what weather conditions can lead to discomfort? Sure. The horse's first response to cold temperatures is to eat more forage. Forage requires microbial fermentation, and this process produces heat, which helps the horse stay warm. So while we are tropical animals and tend to appreciate the warmth, horses actually do quite well in lower temperatures. They acclimate well to different environments, which is one of the reasons we see horses in so many locations around the world. But that being said, the research indicates that most horses are most comfortable at temperatures above 40 degrees when they have their summer coat and above 18 degrees with their winter coat. Below these lower critical temperatures, they will need some additional energy to maintain their body warmth. And the best way to provide that additional energy is by feeding more forage. In addition to temperature, Wind and precipitation, especially rain, can lead to discomfort. Really, wind and precipitation are more likely to cause discomfort in the horse than the cold alone. Yeah, and actually, I think I remember back in the day, or a couple of years ago, reading a study at, that was conducted by someone at Michigan State, where they actually looked at uh, shelter-seeking behavior in horses, and most of the horses only really seeked out shelter when it was when it was moisture, not and maybe some wind, but temperature wasn't really something that made them seek out shelter. So the other follow up question that we have here is, I think the biggest misnomer um, with cold weather care is there's a big segment of the horse industry who believes that you should feed grain and not hay. And you so very clear, very clearly stated that it is that fermentation or that digestibility of forages that really produces the heat. And when horses digest grain, they maybe don't produce as much heat, definitely not as much long-term heat. So is there anything you wanna to add to kind of dispel that super common falsehood that horses should be fed more grain and not more hay when it's cold? I don't have anything to add, but I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah. All right, uh, another question. <clears throat> so access to shelter can be important during the winter months. So what recommendations do you have for access to shelter? I mean, not everybody, it looks like you have a beautiful red barn behind you, right? Um, I, I am not one of those people that has access to a beautiful barn, but I have very good lean-to shelters. So, you know, when it comes to shelters, you know, what is the recommendation? You know, what do horses really need when it comes to shelter? Sure. So access to shelter is important, but just like you were saying, there are many options. Some people keep their horses fully inside, usually an individual stall, and this is sufficient shelter if forage and unfrozen water is also provided. But one concern with horses kept in stalls is making sure that they get enough movement on a regular schedule and we are able to maintain good air quality. So whenever it is possible to keep horses in social groups with free choice access to forage, unfrozen water and shelter, that is definitely preferable. The goal of the shelter is generally to provide a windbreak and cover from precipitation, as you were saying earlier. The shelter should have clean, good footing. I have a barn and I also have uh, lean-to type shelters. I clean mine twice daily and keep them fully bedded with shavings. They should have a large opening and be open on one or two or even three sides. You want to make sure they're located where horses will actually use them. Consider placing them maybe even in the center of a paddock so that horses can choose to stand on all the different sides. I prefer the primary opening to be south facing for northern climates as this gives our horses the most wind protection and sunlight. Average dimensions for sheds are about 12 by 20 or 240 square feet for two horses. Mine is 10 by 24, but I have multiple shelters in a mixed group paddock. You want to 
plan to add about 60 square feet for each additional horse. But this can really vary depending on how well your group of horses share space. Some horses will use the shelter much more than other horses. For instance, my older quarter horse bear loves standing in the shed and does so by far the most frequently of any horse I've had on the property. Whereas my miniature horse prefers to stand next to the shed or under one of the trees. We purposely left some pine trees in our paddock for additional shelter. Yeah, I mean, gosh, those are those are fantastic recommendations. And you know, as you were speaking, the one thing I thought of myself is sometimes states actually have regulations for what constitutes a shelter. In Minnesota, our regulations are quite broad. For example, in some cases, a windbreak may constitute a shelter. As you said, if horses have access to forage and you know flowable water that isn't frozen, but I also think that the safety aspect that you suggested and the openings and the sizes mm -hmm. are so important for people to consider. Yeah. So we're going to move on to what tends to be a controversial topic, right? Like you know, there, we got to ask it, right? Blanketing. Oh my goodness. So blanketing is a source of much discussion among horse owners. So are blankets necessary during the winter? And if not, when might uh, they be a good tool to use when managing horses during winter months? Okay. <laughs> so blanketing is not necessary during the winter, but there are times when blanketing might be used during winter months. So here are just a few examples very young or old horses, especially if they're showing symptoms of being cold, such as excessive shivering, tucking their tails, going off feed, or they just seem more lethargic. Horses with a body condition score of less than five that you are trying to add condition to, which means trying to fatten up. Blanketing the horse could help the horse use any excess calories that they consume to go towards body fat to increase the body condition score as opposed to just staying warm. Horses that have not acclimated to the cold, for instance, those brought to a colder climate in January, February, or even March from a more temperate climate. Horses that are body clipped in some way, and potty clipping is a very useful tool in, with horses that are in full work during the winter months. Clipping really helps to cool the horse out more quickly after they've been worked up and develop a sweat if they're worked. And if hay is in limited or not available quantities that are needed to maintain the body temperature, the horse may lose weight without being blanketed or experience stress. But if you do decide to blanket, here are some really important reminders. Make sure that the blanket fits well and does not rub on the shoulders or bind over the withers and that all the straps allow the horse to lay down but not get their legs stuck. Remove the blankets and groom the horse at least weekly to check for sore spots and groom those places that the horse would normally groom by rolling themselves. Be sure that the blanket is waterproof for outside wear and if the horse gets wet, be ready to change the blankets regularly. My horses live outside in a group social situation and this winter, we've had more days of freezing rain than we normally do, and this is the worst. I was changing blankets every six to 12 hours when the rain was really heavy. So if you can't blanket correctly, it is best to not blanket. Do not feel like you need to blanket all horses. Instead, focus your efforts on improving your shelter and paddock conditions, as well as making sure that there's hay and unfrozen water always available. Another winter care trick is to minimize blanketing before the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year in late December, since the horse will naturally grow the best winter coat up to that time. Then I kind of blanket as much as I want or believe each individual horse needs after that date. Yeah, wow. Uh, Susie, that was so well put. Um, and you're absolutely right. Like if you have a healthy adult horse and they have plenty of body condition, they have shelter and good access to hay. 
they are probably happy as larks outside, even in your current Michigan blizzard, right? Yeah. But if you have that older horse that's already thin and man is a struggle and you can't have them lose weight over winter, then a blank is almost a necessity. So excellent, excellent recommendations. Um, so what other tips do you have for managing horses during the winter months? For example, a lot of people struggle with keeping their waters unfrozen. A lot of people don't want to feed round bales, but struggle with extending the foraging time and even turnout. I mean, maybe after your, I mean, uh, that's a lot of freezing rain events. You start worrying about ice buildup in the paddocks and safety. So maybe just some other winter tips that you have found being both a professional and a personal manager of horses. Sure. Okay. Make sure you have clean, yes, you still have to scrub those water buckets and tanks, unfrozen, properly between 45 and 65 degrees is preferred water at all times. Um, personally, on this farm, one of the best investments I made was an automatic watering machine that is heated and always provides water for the horses. Of course, I still check it twice a day and scrub it as needed. But for me, that was a really, really good purchase. But when I have guest horses that I do boarding all year long, including the winter, then I use a more traditional tank heater because those horses are separated from my horses that live on the farm regularly. And I don't pull the tank heater in and out. And I do monitor the temperature of the water. Um, if you start playing the game of almost letting it freeze or letting it freeze sometimes and then thawing it, you run the risk of the horse not drinking. So that's not good. Snow is not a reliable substitute for water. Um, and when the horses eat hay to stay warm, their water intake will vary with the consumption. And in the winter especially, we're at high risk for colic, especially impaction colic, when they're not drinking enough water or moving around enough. So some recommendations are expect and plan for more forage intake when the temperatures drop. Some studies have shown up to 60% of an increase in consumption during certain conditions. Uh, so plan for it. Always buy more hay than you think you'll need because we don't know what the winter temperatures will bring. Winter footing can be really tricky. For the past few years, I've kept horses in work over the winter at my farm without an indoor arena. And I even campaigned my last horse at fourth level dressage the summer after a hard winter at home without the indoor arena. So we do a lot of hand walking when the footing's icy, but working in fluffy snow is actually a great workout and feels a lot like working a horse over ground poles. In regards to turnout, if the conditions get too icy, I do everything I can to move the horse to better footing to reduce the potential for group conflict. And like I said, I add some hand walking to all the horses. Uh, especially if you're not grooming and riding as often, be sure to put your hands on your horse and assess the body condition score regularly. The horse's winter coat can make it look like the horse might be doing much better, especially in regards to its condition than it really is. Yeah, and you know, I think that is uh, one thing that people kind of forget. Sometimes we go into hiber hibernation mode in the winter months but you really have to keep an eye on those horses. Winter is not a time to not check body condition score, not mm -hmm. keep up the hoof maintenance, you know, not do any grooming, um, really important. So we have a couple questions here. Um, one individual said that they use slow feed hay nets to help extend the horse's foraging time while not giving them access to round bales. I think we both agree that that's a great, that's a great option. Absolutely, yes. And I do as well. Um, I do a combination of round bales and square bales hanging from trees. And uh, in a minute, I'll talk to you about um, the cold days. Basically, my rule of thumb is whenever it dips below 20 degrees, I take an extra square bale and I put separate flakes all over the paddock, which makes all the horses move, gives them lots of extra access to hay. And also, when we get a lot of snow, it helps pack down that snow. So it's not too deep for the smaller horses, but hay nets are fabulous all year long. Yes, I never thought about that. Sometimes the big horses have to make trails for the little ones, don't they? Yeah, 
Yes, and I have quite a variety at my house. So I've seen I it know. Time. I was jealous. I was like, that sounds like a really fun place to live. Mm -hmm. um, so another person just said, uh, suggested the heated water troughs. And um, you know, those are great, like the Richie's, the automatic waters. But those, you know, when you are using your tank heaters, are you doing anything to try to keep that water warmer? For example, do you put that like insulation around the tank? Do you cover half of it? Do you do anything else to try to keep that water warmer? Or are your tank e heaters able to keep up? Uh, I, my tank heaters have been able to keep up, but I've also put the firm hard styrofoam over half of it. Mm -hmm. It depends on the horses because I don't want the horses playing with the tank heater or the styrofoam. So if you have horses that will leave those things alone, otherwise I also use zip ties to secure the tank heater across the top if you have a young horse or playful horse that wants to play with those. And we all have one, right? Banking snow along the edge can also act oh. as great insulators. So I'll often do that through the winter. Yeah, actually that's a great, I forget about that one because snow is a wonderful insulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny I asked this question since you guys are in the middle of a snowstorm and you've had lots of freezing rain. So obviously ice and excessive snowfalls are always a concern. What tips do you have for managing these weather issues? And I think you already kind of touched on some of those. And maybe just touch on if you ever plow or snow blow your paddocks. I know there's pros and cons to that as well. Sure, so ice is hard to deal with. Um, but excessive snowfall is usually pretty great. Um, when the ground is frozen and not covered in the fluffy snow, I really only walk my horses if I'm exercising them, but you can do this for a really long time and still get some great conditioning. Ice can be dangerous, obviously, for both you and the horse, so when conditions are icy, walk slow and carefully. Before the first snowfall, I also walk all my different areas on my property where I might ride and mark hazards such as dips in the terrain, small trees or other hazards that will get covered in snow. I usually use those like $2 plastic stakes in either in like black or a bright color that I can put around my property. And this way I kind of know my terrain so that it's safer for the horses when I ride. While I do do a lot of shoveling to access the barn area, I found that the spreading the hay flakes out on the um, fresh snow helps my horses to pack it all down pretty quickly. And the horses will make paths through the snow to pack it down nicely and keep it more manageable. Um, I haven't had to do much shoveling for the horses, but I have enough horses in my space. My concern with snow blowing or plowing is then creating a slick, mm -hmm. flat ice area whereas the snow keeps giving them traction. So the, the flakes being spread around works really well for me. Also, don't spread shavings out on ice because although that'll give you like immediate traction, it also then insulate the ice, which will take it longer to melt away. So sand or ash, like from a wood burning fireplace, for instance, work really well. And then they dissipate into the soil as soon as the ice begins to melt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I've even seen people try to put like um, straw or hay on top of ice, but man, that just also, that almost slides with the horse. It doesn't really give them traction. Um, <clears throat> the only other uh, concern, and maybe you can cover, is I know a lot of people like to use salt, um, kind of like what they use just on roads to help get rid of ice or what you might use in your sidewalk. You know, we may be, there, I, I'm not aware, maybe you are, any research done on horse hooves, but that's a frequent question we get. And obviously we got, I mean, sand works well too, but then like you said, you need to feed in hay nests or something so that they don't accidentally ingest that sand. So maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, the whole salt sand issue with trying to manage ice and horses. Sure, yeah. And, and when you first started talking, I thought about it from a few different perspectives. So I tend not to put a ton of salt out because I'm concerned about the horses and ingesting it. And certainly the, the ash and the sand you put out would be in the high traffic areas, but hopefully not where you're then feeding the horse. So kind of keeping those areas separate. And additionally, something else I thought of is 
in the indoor uh, arena that I use regularly with my, my writing students, we use a product, I think it's called MAG, that we put on the sand. And it's kind of amazing. And that we never water the arena and it's never dusty because it manages the moisture content and pulls it from the air. And I was a little skeptical at first about uh, causing abrasions or damage to the horse's hooves or legs. And I can honestly say we've really had no problems and it's a pretty terrific pro product because knowing that it doesn't damage the horse's legs or skin or hooves, but we reduce that respiration intake of all the, the particles in the air is really beneficial. Because where I live in Northern Michigan, there are months at a time where you could not water the arena because it was is freezing all the time. I know I, I that, that it's always great to have those practical recommendations from somebody that has actually had to live in an area where the air hurts your face, right? Like that's right. the famous social media meme. But it's it's good. I mean, that I think that's just um, fantastic advice. All right, so we've had some great questions online. Keep them coming. Um, we're kind of rolling through on the questions that we've had. Um, so really uh, getting down to our final couple questions. I think we all have struggled with ice balls in the horse's hooves and we've seen them skating across. Um, I myself have spent countless hours when my kids were little, we had a pony. My gosh, he was like a magnet for ice balls. Um, so I've spent lots of time chipping ice out of hooves. Do you have any tips um, on how to keep snow and ice from accumulating in horse hooves? Sure. Um, number one, horses should continue to get regular hoof trims, even though their hooves do grow slower during the winter time. And talk to your farrier about how to best balance the hoof for winter conditions in your area. There are a number of different trimming techniques that can help reduce the ice balls on barefoot horses. Barefoot horses are ideal in these harsh winter conditions, but sometimes horses do need to wear shoes. And if your horse wears shoes, again, talk to your farrier. Up here, all of the horses that I know that have to wear shoes have these special, we call them snow popper pads under their shoes. And they're hard plastic with a half circle dome in the middle. And they really do work to significantly reduce the ice and snow buildup on the sole of the horse's hooves. Uh, that being said, whenever you see your horse walking on hard surfaces, especially as you enter the barn, a cement barn aisle, I keep a hoof pick by the door. And actually we also keep a hammer by the door because <laughs> sometimes it gets so frozen that a hoof pick will just break. And we gently hammer the hoof ball itself and tap it to get it to either fall out or break apart. So really important that you check those feet before you bring them into a hard surface like that. I am fortunate that we get a lot more snow than the ice and slush, um, but we still deal with those snowballs in the hooves. Yes. Yeah, and Susie, I have no experience with this personally. I've never tried it, but maybe you know or somebody maybe you've tried or you know somebody that has. I've had some people say that they take cooking spray and spray on the hooves or they take Vaseline and you know smear on the hooves. To me that would kind of go away immediately. So I don't know if you have tried that, if that's sound advice, if you know anybody else who's tried, maybe those or any other products that claim to help reduce that amount of accumulation of those ice balls. Yeah, and I've heard that same recommendation and I've also tried using it. I found that it wears off too quickly and the, the short-term effects are only short-term effects. Um, so I, I bought the bottles of cooking spray and sprayed like crazy, but I mean, at least twice a day when I went back out, their feet were filled again. So I think jury's still out on that. Um, if you find that it works for you and on the short-term in your conditions, go for it. But I think long-term is a way to manage the horse outside. It tends to wear off and, and get pulled off with the snow too quickly. Yeah, I, th I think that that's probably what a lot of people would experience. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have any other suggestions or anything else that you just want to share with people when it comes to managing horses in a northern colder climate? 
Sure. Uh, my first one is make sure that you are comfortable outside. Sometimes mm -hmm. we are uncomfortable when we're out working with our horses and we suddenly think that our horses are. So I, some things that I do to make myself more comfortable when I work with my horses through the winter, I have a radiant heat lamp set up over where I groom and tack up that I turn on while I'm grooming and tacking up. I wear a huge winter coat that zips up the back and kind of acts like a quarter sheet on the horse when I ride in it. They sell these really all over now. It's, I wear extra warm socks and gloves. And finally, soft shell riding breeches are fabulous if there's any wind at all. And many of them have polar fleece on the inside too. So make sure that you've got the gear to be comfortable and you're dressed in layers. Be aware that cold temperatures can cause stress to the horse's respiratory system, especially if they have any pre-existing conditions. But poor indoor quality air and exposure to allergens can be more detrimental. So keeping your horses outside is generally better for the respiratory system, but maybe reduce the intensity of your workload in very cold weather. If you do work your horse and they become sweaty, you need to cool them out before turning them back out. A wet coat, especially with a hot body, does not insulate and protect the horse from the cold very well. So a few tips include spraying them with an alcohol spray and using a hard brush on sweaty coats, using a hair dryer or a blower, using wool or polar fleece coolers, they're like blankets you put over the horse, and walking the horse out in a protected area. And finally, allowing the horse to eat hay in a protected area such as a stall, usually while wearing a cooler, and if your horse routinely gets sweaty when you work them, consider working them at a lower intensity or trying out one of the body clipping techniques that I referred to earlier. So I'd say in conclusion, don't expect that you can do everything you do in the non-winter months, but embrace winter care and conditioning as a time to relax a little while you maintain a base level of fitness and maybe even cross train your horse in a way you wouldn't normally do. Wow, that was fantastic. So the other thing I, I have seen, I don't have one, but I probably should. Have you seen those little heated jackets or vests that have like the built-in coils? Have you ever have tried one. those? I do, I, I have Are they one. worth it? They're so worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a heated vest and I'm a person that's always cold. And my heated vest can get me overly warm. It's pretty amazing. You do have to remember to charge it. So all those battery pack things, they have to be charged when you wanna go use them. Um, but if you can work that into your routine, they make, they're good. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, the other tip that I always like is sometimes like the tips of your fingers or the tips of your toes get cold no matter how hard you try, but they do make those little reusable like, uh, what are they warming packets? You kind of break them and they produce heat. Have you ever used those with success? Um, I do, but again, you have to make sure you have a pile of them and you don't run out. So they can be helpful. Um, mostly I try to just stick with having the right gear to begin with and dressing in layers and keep moving. <laughs> yeah. So we do have a question and I think we can even see it in the background of your picture. Somebody was just asking how you keep your trees so nice when they are in, in the paddocks with the horses. You know, it's funny because I have, uh, the picture doesn't totally show it, but I had quite a few pine trees when I put up the fencing around the area that I call my paddock, which is my sacrifice lot area. And at first I said, let's clear all the trees. And then I thought maybe we'll leave some for shelter. And I didn't love them. And I was worried the horses would get covered in pine sap. And I decided to leave six as an experiment. And honestly, I love them because the horses do use them for shelter. I've cut off all the lower branches. So there's a big canopy on top. And I hang hay in hay nets from them. And I rotate where the hay is. So they have to kind of find the hay. Um, and they rub against them some, but it hasn't really been a big problem. And because I have forage available all the time, mm -hmm. the chewing I think is a lot less than if I didn't. So they've done okay. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, um, I think we've got through all the questions that we have. We've got through all the questions from the individuals that asked them online. I'll kind of give you your last, you know, here's your, I'll do one last little update to make sure I don't miss any questions. But you know, Susie, you have just done a fantastic job such great advice from like the scientific viewpoint, but also just from that, I'm a horse owner living in a cold climate. And I am so impressed that you think of snow as, as those cross rails, like that is such a positive attitude and that you've been able to keep horses fitness maintained in the winter. That is not an easy thing to do um, in Michigan without a indoor. So kudos to you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our how to care for horses in Northern climates with Susie White from Michigan State University. And I hope you will join us next month. Thank you.